Hi everybody, uh, and a warm welcome to this session. Uh, we're going to talk about Italians-led security today, um, and on the theme that there is no such thing as bad weather, only unsuitable clothing. So, uh, my name is Stefan Lager. I'm the uh, SVP of Global Service Lines. So we are responsible for our global managed service offering. And to uh, guide us through this session, we also have the expert uh, with us here in the room. And Charles, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Thanks, Stefan. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Charles van der Valt. Um, I'm talking to you today from Cape Town in uh, South Africa, so the other end of the world from uh, Stefan. Um, and I, uh, I am the head of uh, security research for Orange uh, Cyber Defense, uh, based, as I said, here in Cape Town, but reporting into our global um, marketing technology division uh, based in Paris. So. If you were able to join us for our uh, introductory panel session this morning, then you would have heard us talking extensively about uh, th this analogy that we draw uh, between the, the cyber threat landscape and the notions of uh, climate and weather and, uh, and how, they how they interact and how they uh, have an impact on each other. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we would have convinced you at least somewhat that. Um, that the analogy holds and that there's some use in thinking, some value in thinking about the cyber landscape uh, in the same ways that we think about uh, climate and weather. But ultimately, in the end, uh, we end up in a situation where uh, we, we have intelligence in some form. You know, we have some forewarning about uh, what weather is going to come, how it's going to be, uh, and how that might affect us. Uh, but it's only really of any use if we translate that into some kind of action, you know, if we can apply that intelligence uh, in some way. Um, and I was very pleased to find this, uh, this quote by Charles Dudley Warner, who was a, an author and a lyricist back in the 1800s. Uh, and he, in fact, this, this saying was so popular, he was quoted by Mark Twain. And he really captured this idea, you know, everyone complains about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Um, and so what Stefan and I really want to try and capture for you uh, in this session is, is to give you some insight into our approach to doing something about the intelligence that we uh, connect for you uh, and on your behalf. And we'll be taking you through our, our approach uh, to what we call an intelligence-led security uh, and illustrating hopefully in, in practical ways how that, uh, how that impacts our operations and how it can impact uh, your business also. So traditionally, when, when we think of um, cyber threat intelligence or cyber intelligence, uh, we think about it in these, in these three levels. And at the very top end, uh, we think about uh, st strategic intelligence. This is um, to do with those, those changes in climate, right? The long trends and systemic changes uh, and they really should be used to, to set our, uh, our priorities and, and drive our strategy uh, broadly in one direction or another. Uh, at the low, level below that, uh, we think about in operational intelligence. Uh, this is, this is in, uh, closer to real time on the ground, allows us to really decide where we're going to invest our resources at any given uh, time. We want to we want to focus our attention, focus our energy, focus our resources on uh, in the places where we're the most vulnerable and where the adversary is most likely to strike. Uh, and then finally, we talk about intelligence at the tactical level, and this is really near real time, and it's probably the form of intelligence that most of you are the most familiar with. Uh, you know, these are the the indicators, if you like, the at the atomic uh, little uh, objects. Of, uh, of intelligence, uh, usually in the form of IP addresses or file hashes or something along those lines that generally get consumed and responded to by a, by a system. So this is traditionally how, you know, the, the industry thinks about uh, intelligence and it also applies to us. You know, we think about intelligence along these levels too. But this doesn't say anything about how 
we make sure that this intelligence actually impacts our operations, right? This is still not doing something about intelligence. Uh, and so Stefan and I want to introduce this, uh, this concept, which is, which is by no means new, but which we think doesn't get given the attention that it deserves as a, as a paradigm. Uh, and it's an idea called intelligence-led security, which really captures what we're trying to do, doesn't it? It, it, it introduces this idea that our, our operations, our strategy, our, our tactics should be led by the, uh, by the intelligence. Um, and, and apart from just notionally introducing the idea in the phrase itself, it, uh, it also introduces two very fundamental uh, concepts. Uh, the first is that we need to in collect intelligence in order to be intelligence led, we need to collect intelligence, not only about the adversary, not only about what's happening uh, outside of our environment, uh, but we also need to introduce it, uh, it collected at least about our own environment. So internal intelligence. And it's where these two uh, sources of intelligence um, correspond, where they overlap. That's where we have the opportunities to make, to make change and to truly be uh, intelligence uh, led. Uh, and the reason, as I said previously, that we want to do that is so that we can apply our resources, apply our energy, and set our course in the direction uh, where it will have the most, the most impact. So let's, let's dive into that idea a, a, little, a little more. You know, in, in our thinking about uh, intelligence, we make a distinction between what we call above the line and below the line intelligence. So above the line is the traditional, if you like, threat intelligence, the, the information, the data we collect about the adversary, what they're doing, how their tactics, techniques, and procedures are training, changing, uh, what infrastructure they're using, you know, how they're interacting with each other. Now, all of that intelligence is useful. It gives us a sense of how the threat around us is, uh, is, is changing. Uh, but for that to be useful, we also really have to understand ourselves, understand our environment, understand our assets and where they're valuable to us, uh, understand the patterns of our, of our, of our people, understand the vulnerabilities uh, where, we, where we might, uh, you know, where we might be struck and how we might be struck in terms of how we're vulnerable. And really, we, we steal here um, from, a, from a notion that was uh, introduced by Sun Tzu in The Art of War, where he says, very famously, know thyself and know thy enemy and you'll be undefeated in a thousand battles. Um, and often when we're talking about threat intelligence, you know, we talk about the know thy enemy part. That's the bit that we emphasize. But, um, but we tend to underestimate, we tend to underemphasize the know thyself component. Now, you know, knowing thyself is a philosophical uh, construct also, uh, but we believe we can make it practical in the delivery of our services by equipping our customers to know some very specific things about themselves, uh, where they have an advantage over the adversary. These are things that our customers, uh, we believe with our help can know about themselves, which take time and effort for the adversary to learn. Uh, and in learning the adversary, where the adversary may also risk exposing themselves. Uh, and there, there are multiple, con multiple uh, concepts that, that feed into the know, know yourself paradigm. Uh, but in this graphic, we really just want to in, uh, emphasize two. Uh, the first is what we, what we call identify, as, as Stefan will illuminate for us in, in a moment. Uh, that's really about knowing uh, our assets uh, and knowing our um, attack surface. So what is it that we have to uh, protect and where is that exposed? Uh, and the next is about detection. That's uh, detection, e detecting either vulnerabilities uh, on our system, so you know what opportunities are there for the attacker, or detecting the attacker where they do step uh, out of, if you like, the anonymous internet, internet space and into environments where we have visibility. And that gives us a very good opportunity to um, use our home field advantage uh, to gain intelligence not only about the adversary but also about ourselves. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Stefan to just talk us a little bit more through uh, how our, our services are structured and, and, and how we can use them to, to deliver value to you. Thank you so much, Charles. So Charles talked about you know, the two perspectives of knowing your adversary and knowing yourself. Um, but what can we do with this knowledge? So I think that apart from, from having this knowledge, we need to do something about that. And one is to be able to proactively protect yourself. 
as good as possible and reduce the risk of critical incidents. The other one is also to accept that there will never be such thing as 100% protection, so you will have incidents. The cost and the impact of those incidents are have a, related not only to how quickly you can detect them, but also how quickly and effectively you can respond to them. So if you put all of this together, then it ends up with what we call our different uh, service areas. So it really starts with anticipating. It's about observing the landscape, understanding vulnerabilities, threats and attacks. Once we have that, we can go in to identify and understand uh, yourself in terms of identifying your assets and your specific attack surface. So identify as being the second one. Once we know this, we can now go into the protect service area. So it's all about making sure that you can uh, reduce your attack surface as good as possible, understanding what you require, uh, what kind of technology, what kind of, of pro product and people and processes do you require. Into the detection, because we can't protect against everything, so we need to have a strategy for detection. How do we detect things? How do we do this across cloud, across OT, across on-premise and so on? How do we do it based on logs? How do we do it based on network activities or endpoint activities? But even more important, once we have these detections, we also need to have a plan to what to do with that. So respond being the last portion of the different service areas. But within the service area, it's also important to understand specific vertical requirements. There are specific uh, threats and solutions for healthcare, for example. It's all for, for finance, for retail, for manufacturing. There are also specific threats and solutions for specific and certain environments like cloud and, and OT, industrial control systems, IoTs. So all of these needs to be taken into consideration as well. And to best serve our customers, we have an extensive service options ranging from equipment resell into integration services, into full and co-managed services, and to try to fill uh, the individual and unique gaps uh, for all the customers that they may have. But putting all of that into specific silos and different solutions is usually not a good idea. So, so how can we now drive synergies between different services and different service areas? How can we uh, you know, get synergies and, and, and create more effective cybersecurity solutions? And this is what I'm gonna go uh, look a bit more into detail now. So I'm gonna hand it over to Charles again. Thanks, Stefan. So, so what you're seeing on the screen now is a, is, a, is a depiction of what we call our intelligence backbone. An intelligence backbone is a combination of uh, technologies, uh, people and, and processes that are put in place to ensure that we are systematically collecting the right data about our customers and about the landscape, that that data is being processed into intelligence uh, by suitably equipped and suitably um, empowered people um, and that that uh, resultant intelligence is driving its way through into the various service offerings that Stefan outlined. Um, and then finally, that the value of that intelligence and the enriched intelligence that comes from the application uh, of, uh, of the data to a service is fed back and finds its way through to the other services. So there's really uh, three, three concepts. The, the first concept, which you'll see at the top of the screen, is that we need to collect intelligence. Uh, and like almost every other player in the space, uh, there are some traditional places we can collect intelligence from, like the threat intelligence feeds, the vulnerability feeds. Uh, there's plenty of data floating around. Uh, in fact, our threat intelligence Engine collects data from more than 500 distinct data feeds. Um, but uh, being, being an operator and, and being a, a provider of, uh, of, of some size, we also have the opportunity to produce our own intelligence. Uh, and there's various parts of our operations within uh, our cyber defense specifically, but then brought more broadly within uh, Orange Business Services and within um, Orange itself that produce intelligence uh, out of our operations, either internally or with respect to the customers. So all that data has to come in and then it comes into a, a huge, huge technology platform we call the data lake, uh, which uh, if you like is the storage unit of this uh, backbone of ours. And there we need to apply various forms of processing to intelligence uh, to, to convert it into those, those different forms that we spoke about earlier. 
Um, and we really, we really think about it in terms of levels, as we, as we mentioned previously, there's a tactical forms of intelligence, operational forms of intelligence and strategic. Uh, and then also in terms of classes. And here broadly, we speak about uh, cyber threat intelligence and vulnerability intelligence. Um, both of which are, are really essential to understanding uh, as we as Sun Tzu uh, expected us to in understanding both the adversary and ourselves. Um, and it, for each one of the, uh, the, the, the quadrants, if you like, in, uh, in that matrix, uh, we have a specific discipline, a specific process that is producing intelligence uh, that is appropriate at that level and is the right form and is being produced at the right time. And I won't go into each of them now. Uh, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, but that captures our, uh, if you like, in anticipates set of activities uh, from the model that Stefan uh, shared earlier. Um, and most of these, in fact, everything that you're seeing on the screen in front of you now are also directly consumable by the client. So you can request uh, either as, in, as part of a commercial offering or as uh, you know, some of our uh, community outreach offerings, you can get access to these intelligence outputs so that they can serve your processes directly also. But more powerfully uh, from our perspective is that these offerings then are fed through the backbone out into the various components of our um, service delivery offering uh, in, in very, uh, again, very predictable, very industrialized ways. We wanna make sure that every piece of intelligence that we glean from every one of these processes finds its way to the right person or the right technology, wherever we are touching a customer, wherever we are uh, attempting to add value to a customer. And in order to properly close the loop to complete uh, the threat intelligence life cycle, we also need to make sure that we gather back uh, observations and feedback uh, from those operations that further and help us to, uh, to, to enrich our offerings. Uh, and that could, be, that could be simple things like um, from our CSIRT services, Stefan spoke about uh, CSIRT, we can glean whether uh, intelligence indicators which we collected and processed were actually involved in a real life compromise. And that can give us confidence about those indicators and we can up their threat profile. We can glean whether uh, vulnerabilities that we, uh, that we learn about on the dark web actually are impacting our customers and to what extent. And we can glean whether um, threat, uh, threat indicators like IP addresses or, or file hashes are actually being seen uh, by our detection operations. And, and so I'm sure it can very quickly become clear to you how, um, how powerfully this system can work to produce actionable threat intelligence, uh, which is immediately impacting our customers in a measurable way um, within our offerings, but can also add value to you outside of our offerings as uh, independently consumable products. Stefan, why don't you talk us through, um, maybe at a more practical level, how this manifests within our offerings? Happy to do so. <laughs> Thank you, Char. So looking a bit into our offering and looking at the intelligence-led services. Um, as we talked about, intelligence service really starts with understanding the threat. So if we don't understand the threat, we don't really know how to identify the threat, how to detect the threat, or even how to protect against the threat. So even you know the front and center is really the global threat research team here, with also the help of our cyber socks, our incident responders, and ethical hackers that really helps us to get a good understanding about the capabilities and, and, and you know what the threat is trying to do to us. So we can share this to our customers in, in what we call specific anticipate services. And, uh, and uh, we can also do, uh, we can share this information and we can empower this in identify services. So, so anticipate services again is about you know understanding the, the uh, adversary but the identify services is more of helping understand what is your current uh, attack surface. And this just goes across different environments also, like cloud and OT, for example, different levels of unavailable scanners or ethical hacking. So, so giving a good understanding about that. It also feeds detection services. So if you look at the detection services, um, the managed threat detection service is all about detecting uh, you know, threats within your infrastructure. And uh, we can do this across different type of data sources. We do this across endpoint activities. We do it across log and network activities, uh, covering basically the whole SOC triad of, of detection. 
But there might also be things uh, that you need to detect that are outside of your infrastructure, being you know outside of your cloud or outside your on-premise infrastructure. Things that happen in, on the uh, open web or the dark web or deep web. And that's where we will complement the detection with our managed cybercrime monitoring services. So it helps us also to do the detection of things that might have been leaked or might have been discussed on, on specific dark web forum that could potentially um, be, a, be a big risk for you as a customer. We also have customers that are building their own cyber socks, um, but they still want to have the capability to, to get some, take part of some of the intelligence that we collect to empower their detection capabilities. So we also have the, the ability to offer that uh, to our customers. In terms of the protect services, it's all about reducing the attack surface. So we have different uh, service domains that cover uh, most of what you're probably used to be in the cyber security industry, like secure infrastructure services, endpoint mobile security, and so on. But the key thing again here is that the way that we can add value is to empower these detection and protection capabilities uh, with our threat intelligence offer. So, um, and I think that's, that's, that's really uh, also one key for this. This intelligence can also be consumed uh, without the service for customers that have their own CyberSoc, for example, with things like uh, threat intelligence protection feed services. And last but not least, uh, we can help our uh, customers to, to respond to the incidents. And this ranges from proactive services to help customers with creating their incident response uh, strategies and processes all the way throughout you know, the first level of, of threat disruption to isolate specific endpoints into a complete incident response service offering that will do all of the eradication and recovery from a specific incident. And, and all of these services are created like specific service bricks because we understand that not one single customer, um, um, you know, they all have their unique requirements and their uh, unique situations. So, so how can we meet them? So we create specific bricks and then the customer can pick and choose what kind of bricks they are uh, they need to to complement their own capabilities so within the managed vulnerability service for example we can only provide external intelligence about what's happening in the wild or we can actively help scan your infrastructure to understand how your specific uh, attack surface looks like but also maybe take the additional step of helping with the protection part of that in the mdr the managed detection response service area uh, you have the, the ability to choose between combinations of doing only detection and only detection on a specific part, like for example, endpoint, into complete detection coverage and then complement that with, with the response options as well. And for the customers that have their own cyber socks, um, we also have the ability to, to offer a complete set of services that will empower their specific uh, services. So we talked a lot about uh, you know, how different things can empower each other in these different services. So I think maybe it would be time to take a, an example and see how can these different services empower each other in a true intelligence-led security way. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Charles again. So we wanted to, we wanted to make this practical for you um, and try and illustrate how this would actually impact you as a, as a customer. Uh, and we chose for that a, uh, an example of a, of a vulnerability. Uh, it's, it's contemporary. Most of you, uh, I think, will have uh, encountered this uh, quite recently. We thought it illustrated quite nicely how, you know, how these things flow together. So as we said, we've, we've got a data lake, which is kind of the brain of the, um, of the intelligence backbone, uh, and various forms of intelligence flow into that, including information about vulnerabilities. And the one we want to share with you um, is a, uh, a Microsoft vulnerability which emerged in the um, the, the August uh, the, the, the August patch bundle that Microsoft does um, involving uh, which became known as Zero Login. Zero Login is a privilege escalation vulnerability, a very uh, allowing an attacker to uh, to to uh, move laterally across across an environment. So. Um, our platform picked this vulnerability up via a feed from Microsoft uh, early in, uh, in August. And it got logged within the platform and uh, kicked off a process of analysis and observation by our vulnerability intelligence team, which is based in Paris. Uh, on the same day, the raw information for that vulnerability is passed through to the various vulnerability scanning uh, teams that we run 
uh, in South Africa, in Paris, and in, and in Sweden. Now, at this point, we, we can only assess the impact of this vulnerability based on the information that Microsoft provided us. So we're in a position to give customers early warning that they're missing the, the relevant patches uh, and to communicate um, from the information we had from Microsoft that it's a severe vulnerability. We can't really tell them much more about that, but the vulnerability intelligence team continues to monitor the vulnerability uh, using the other sources of data that they have, including monitoring um, the, the open web and the dark web. And so um, a few days, uh, well, almost a month later, uh, in September, uh, it comes to our attention that this vulnerability uh, is now uh, being exploited, or at least that there is exploits, there are exploits available. Uh, and our intelligence team concludes two things. Firstly, that the vulnerability is more serious, and perhaps we uh, anticipated, but also because we now know how the exploit works, uh, we can set about detecting attacks for it. So at this point, the, uh, a separate team called the World Watch team is informed that uh, via the backbone that this, uh, this vulnerability, the, the, the severity has been escalated and it's being uh, exploited in the wild. And that advisory, what we call a World Watch signal, uh, gets sent out to our customers via numerous channels. It appears on our website, uh, they receive emails, um, they can get it uh, via a Slack channel. Uh, and of course, internally, all of our operational teams are also informed uh, that this vulnerability has been elevated and that it's uh, being exploited in the wild. The threat detection teams who will then receive this advisory um, will then commence uh, analyzing it to understand how it can potentially be uh, detected. Uh, there's a center of excellence around uh, threat detection uh, where uh, experts from various teams all over the world collaborate um, to understand the exploit and understand how we can, we can best detect it. And as a result of that, on the very next day, uh, tickets are logged across our various uh, customer estates to uh, commence threat hunts for, that for attempts to exploit that particular uh, vulnerability. And what I really liked about this, uh, this, this example was, as it happens, uh, there are several customers that are uh, impacted and notified uh, that this is the case. And I like this, uh, I like this example for, for a number of reasons. Firstly, I think it demonstrates very nicely the flow uh, from raw intelligence through various forms of processing by appropriate level kinds of experts through to where it impacts the, the customer. Uh, secondly, I like how it illustrates the different forms of intelligence, so both vulnerability and threat intelligence uh, coming into play here. We want to discuss, discover where the customer is vulnerable, but also discover where they're being um, attacked. And finally, I really like this because uh, we can close the loop on this one. So at the end of this, uh, we, we are able to tap into the, 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 um, the advisories that go to the clients and uh, further update our own intelligence to, uh, to note that customers are actually being attacked and how and where they're being attacked from. So we wanna wrap up then um, just by summarizing for you these different uh, intelligence products and um, how they can be consumed uh, by you. Uh, we have within our, within our leadership um, uh, a very strong legacy uh, in, the, in the intelligence and military intelligence space. Um, and, and so we're guided to think about our intelligence outputs uh, along the lines of this matrix that uh, we're presenting to you now. There's intelligence outputs that, have a, that are long-term in perspective and have a, a long life expectancy and others that are short-term in perspective and, and really need to be processed almost immediately or they're useless. Uh, and then some of us, some of them talk more acutely about uh, issues at a tactical level uh, that are a little bit akin to the weather. You know, is it actually raining now? And others talk more about the climate, you know, where are the high pressures and the low pressures going and how is that likely to shape the weather in the, in the future. So let's look at the offerings that we've touched on uh, in this presentation and just summarize them for you on this scale. Firstly, on the bottom left hand quadrant, we have the managed threat intelligence offering. So this is, uh, this is near to real time uh, atomic indicators of, uh, of compromise and attack. So things that would feed into your firewall, into your seam, and into your threat uh, hunting operations, as they do into ours, um, they're, they're very robust, very high speed, highly available, 
uh, and very, very rich in terms of the volume of indicators that we're able to provide, and more importantly, the quality of indicators that we're able to provide. Uh, there are two uh, interfaces there. There's a human readable interface and a machine readable interface. So you can either query our data or feed it directly into your systems. And then very closely related to that, um, the, the intelligence source that we touched on our example, which is our managed vulnerability intelligence. Uh, now, similarly, this is uh, near to real time. Uh, given that this intelligence requires a little bit more uh, analysis time by our experts, it's not quite as uh, real time. And given that vulnerabilities have a longer shelf life than, than threats, uh, it, it, it tends a little bit more towards the long-term uh, end of the, of the spectrum. Again, this product is commercially available to our customers just in exactly the same form that we use it internally uh, and can be consumed via a, a feature-rich UI or directly uh, via uh, machine interfaces into your own platforms. And then we touched also in the example on something called Worldwatch. Worldwatch is a, a service that seeks to summarize all of this other intelligence um, put it into one place, make it very digestible for sort of mid-tier technical security leaders um, and provides uh, acute, actionable uh, intelligence at the tactical level. So in the World Watch service, that manifests in the form of bulletins that can go out to you via email, via our portal or via um, a chat channel. And um, it's it's added as, a, as an add-on to cust for customers who consume our other managed services. And it's, it's sort of towards the tactical end of the spectrum, but uh, does touch on some sort of emerging trends and therefore has some significance at the more strategic end of the spectrum. Uh, the World Watch service then also produces a monthly report, which zooms out a little bit from the daily briefings and, and provides you a sort of consolidated view um, uh, you know, over the month. And so that, uh, that report is, uh, tends a little bit more towards the long term. Uh, but it is also still primarily a tactical thing. You know, it's what, about what you should be doing uh, today and tomorrow, maybe next week or next month, but not more than that. However, uh, from the data that, that, that flows through the backbone, uh, we are also able to produce a very rich set of analytical tools. Uh, and so we have a, a front end, a visual front end to the... Um, to, to the backbone uh, that allows us to pull trends, statistics, hotspots, et cetera, from all of the forms of intelligence uh, that go in and come out. So at any given point, we're able to do what we call telling stories about stories uh, and present perspectives uh, on a regional level, on an industry level, uh, across all of the intelligence and operational services that we offer. Uh, to help our customers understand you know, what is happening in their space and what are other customers seeing in their space. Now, Stories About Stories um, is a platform that we use, but we can share it with customers. And um, you know, we're happy to do it as part of, uh, of customer briefings to, to help them understand what we understand about their space. Then uh, we have what we call our threat intelligence reports. Threat intelligence reports come out on an ad hoc basis. They're delivered by our open source intelligence teams. And they really, they really examine the threats and vulnerabilities uh, in a given segment in very, very deep detail. So we do reports on pharmaceuticals, on manufacturing, on cryptocurrencies, et cetera. And these threat reports are available on a subscription basis from our website, uh, free, to, free, free to use for anyone. We also produce on an annual basis what we call our navigator intelligence report. We're very excited because uh, as we speak, that report is... Uh, being finalized and made ready for you. And it really captures um, a, everything we've learned uh, over the period of a year from these processes uh, acting out. Um, so if you wanna understand, uh, you know, what kind of perspectives we can offer, and if you really wanna understand what's happening in the world around you, um, then you can sign up and receive our Navigator report um, to, you know, to benefit from, from all of these activities. And then finally, at the sort of very top right of the quadrant, we have what we call our state of the threat report, uh, which is really what was shared with you during the keynote panel uh, for, for World 2020, which is where we try to understand at the very highest level, at, at the level of, uh, of climate and systems, uh, what the factors are that are shaping our environment. Um, and it's from that understanding of those factors that the rest of our intelligence processes and um, 
and service strategy development, et cetera, all uh, take their shape. And so there you have it on a map. Uh, that's how our uh, intelligence offerings are made available to you. Uh, as you'll see, some of them are commercially available, but very many of them are there for you to benefit from um, simply by subscribing or uh, letting us know that you want them and we'll make sure we get them to you. Um, and with that, uh, I think all that's left of us is for us to say thank you very much uh, from me and from Stefan for your time. We hope this has been of value to you and uh, we look forward to talking with you more about uh, our intelligence-led services and how they can benefit you. Thank you. Thank you.